All right. <clears throat> this is on tort claims. Ah, for the record, the scope of this case, although it involves a general act of Congress, is geographically constricted. The holding is applicable only to actions under the Federal Tort Claims Act arising out of wrongful death in Massachusetts. The court, finding the words Federal Tort Claims Act so clear, reverses the judgment of the Court of Appeals, which has special responsibility for interpreting federal law in matters unique to its circuit. Underlying the court's reasoning is the belief that the language of the 1947 amendment is so clear that it would require reconstruction of the amendment to limit the amount of the judgment to the maximum recoverable under the Massachusetts Act. On more than one occasion, but evidently not frequently enough, Judge Hand has warned against restricting the meaning of a statute to the meaning of its plain words. There is no surer way to misread any document than to read it literally. Of course, one begins with the words of a statute to ascertain its meaning, but one does not end with them. The notion that the plain meaning of the words of a statute defines the meaning of the statute reminds one of T.H. Huxley's gay observation to the effect that at times a theory survives long after its brains are knocked out. The words of this legislation are as plain as the court finds them to be only if that amendment is read in misleading isolation. An amendment is not a repeal. An amendment is part of the legislation it amends. The 1947 amendment to the Federal Tort Claims Act of 46 must be read to harmonize with the central purpose of the original act. The central purpose of the original act was to allow recovery against the United States on the basis and to the extent of recoveries for like torts committed by private people in the state in which the act or omission giving rise to the claim against the United States occurred. The amendment filled the gap, a very small gap that was disclosed in the scheme formulated by the former act. The gap was the situation revealed in two of the states, namely Alabama and Massachusetts. When the Federal Tort Claims Act was passed, the Death Act of both Alabama and Massachusetts provided for assessment of the defendant's liability for damages on a punitive basis. In Alabama, however, there was no maximum limitation on that, and the problem of this case, namely whether a recovery in excess of the maximum recoverable against a private employer can be had against the United States, is therefore unique to recovery against the United States under the Massachusetts Death Act. In filling the gap, Congress was concerned only to provide for recovery against the United States for wrongful deaths in Massachusetts and Alabama and to provide for a recovery, as did the original one, on a compensatory, not a punitive basis. There's nothing to indicate and it is unreasonable to suppose that Congress meant a recovery in Massachusetts to be unlimited in amount in the face of the state's statutory limitation at the same time that recoveries in the dozen other states with limitations could be restricted. Such a construction does not merely take Massachusetts plaintiffs out of the scheme of the Federal Tort Act. It does so by putting them in a better position than plaintiffs in the dozen other states with statutory ceilings. This imputes to Congress a desire to, create, to correct the inequity in the original act by creating an inequity in the new amendment. Of course, <clears throat> the Massachusetts limitation is contained in a statute in which damages are related to a punitive rather than a compensatory basis. The purpose of the 1947 amendment was to allow recovery against the United States when the governing state statute measured damages on such a basis. With the sole exception that the state statute puts the recovery on a harsher basis, the state statute is the governing statute. It may well be that if Massachusetts were to enact a statute restricting recovery to compensatory damages, it would impose a different ceiling, but that is no reason to reject <clears throat> the ceiling in its present statute. It does not comport with good sense and reason to suppose that a state would impose a higher ceiling on a recovery based on compensatory damages 
than it does when it allows punitive damages. Okay, <clears throat> for the record, let me start by talking about what circumstantial evidence is. If you see or hear or smell something, like right now I can see you and you can see me, that's called direct evidence. You don't have to draw any inferences with that kind of evidence. However, if there is a piece of evidence presented, for example, we have the syringe here, you can draw some inferences from that. From the fact that Mr. Bro had that syringe, you can infer he rammed it into his arm when he would inject cocaine. That is what we call circumstantial evidence. From the fact of the syringe in Mr. Bro's possession at the time of his arrest, you can infer he was using the drug cocaine. The law says that if there is more than one interpretation of the evidence that has been brought before you, more than one reasonable interpretation, that you must adopt the interpretation that favors the accused. For example, with the syringe, you could find that even though it was in Mr. Burrow's possession, maybe he found it while he was running to the park just before he was arrested. That is possible, but the law says that if there are two interpretations, one being he used it to inject cocaine in his arm, you must adopt the interpretation that favors the accused. And the law says you must do that even though one interpretation is more favorable or more reasonable than the other. Let us assume for just a minute that you find there were two interpretations of the circumstantial evidence, but one is much more favorable than the other. The law says that you must adopt the interpretation that favors the accused. So when the prosecution stands up here and picks up a piece of evidence and tells you that maybe this is the way it occurred or this is what it means, you should keep in mind if there are other reasonable interpretations, the law says you must adopt that interpretation which favors Mr. Bro. Let's apply the rules I have talked to you about to the facts of the case. As you know, I will have just one opportunity to see you and so I am going to pause here before I discuss the first question you will have to face and address a concern I have. The prosecution stood up here this morning and argued for about two and a half hours and then it's my turn to argue. The reason I get a chance to come up here is this. I get to tell you first off what our position is and I will give you our explanation of the evidence. I have a chance to respond to the state's interpretation of the evidence and that's fair. That is the way the system works. He presents his arguments and then I get a chance to respond to them. And then I present my argument and he gets a chance to respond to my comments here. But what has happened in this case is the prosecution has done what my dad used to call sandbagging. If you play poker, what the prosecution has done, he hasn't talked to you at all about the real facts of the case. He hasn't even mentioned Dr. Rosen. But after I sit down over there and don't have a chance to speak for Mr. Bro any longer, when my voice is silent for the last time in this trial, then the prosecution will come up here with his prepared notes and he will argue about Dr. Rosen. And I would suggest that when that happens, you must understand that I will not get another chance to respond. I don't know what he's going to say about Dr. Rosen or some of the other evidence. And so I would ask you not to accept those remarks of the prosecutor at face value because the reason we have the system of him going first and then me and then him is so each side can test the other person's arguments to see whether they stand the test of questioning and reasoning. I just ask that when this happens in this case, when I sit down and I don't have an opportunity to respond, I'd ask that you not accept uncritically what is said. I'll try to anticipate as best I can what he'll say about the evidence and respond to it, but I'm sure that I'm going to miss some points and not have a chance to respond. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's go back to the rules of law in this case. Let's first talk about felony murder. The first question I would suggest that you decide as jurors after you deal with the other charges by simply checking guilty on those, the first question is whether Mr. Bro is guilty of first degree felony murder. 
The rule of law you need is the rule that defines when the robbery is complete. Was the robbery complete before the killing occurred? That's how you will decide in this case whether or not there is first degree felony murder. The evidence we have seen in this case is that Mr. Bro, after he got into the victim's car, drove her to a parking lot in the back of the church. And at that point in time in the back of the church, Mr. Bro was in a position of temporary safety. There were no people chasing after him. And when he took over the car, he was in an unchallenged possession of the victim's car. You will have here defense exhibits K, L, and M, which are photographs of the back of the church parking lot. For the record, if I may interrupt for just a moment, I haven't had time to read the Lily Bridge case, but under Maynard, we are dealing with a somewhat different factual situation here. In that situation, if you have had time to read it, two doctors had been appointed by the court. The doctors, Miles and Allen, were appointed to confidentially assist the defense. Thereafter, the defense entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. The court reappointed appointed those same two doctors to report back. The defense never attempted to recall those two doctors as defense witnesses. The defense never undertook any acts which could be in any, any way viewed as being a waiver of the privilege. The Supreme Court held in this case that in the absence of a waiver of the privilege, and in fact, when the defendant affirmatively asserted the privilege, it was error by the court to compel those two psychiatrists to testify. In our present situation here, you are proposing to the court to utilize Dr. Wing, who was immediately appointed confidentially to testify, as I understand it, until now on a limited area, or to present an opinion on a very limited issue concerning the defendant. There has been no not guilty by reason of insanity plea entered at this time. The question before this court is whether or not there can be such a thing as a limited waiver of the privilege. In the Lily Bridge case, they talked about privilege applying unless it is waived. It is your contention, counselor, that the Lily Bridge case discussed that issue of a limited waiver, or do you have any authority for the proposition that there is such a concept under the law as a limited waiver of privilege? There is no question that privilege does apply here. I'm not challenging that at all. And there is absolutely no question that if you were to decide not to put the doctor on the stand, there is no way that the people can ever have access to the report. But my question to you is once you put the doctor on the stand, once you ask him questions concerning his opinion of the defendant, which opinion, by the way, was based in part upon the confidential communication between you and the client, upon the psychotherapist privilege, privilege communications between your client, the doctor directly, then how are the people going to able to effectively act? Let me reword that. How are the people going to be able to effectively cross-examine the witness if they're only going to be allowed to see the tip of the iceberg? Now, I know that it is too narrow a view to just focus on the written report. The ultimate question is to what extent may the prosecution inquire whether it is a question of discovery of written documentation or whether it is a question of the doctor's opinion. The real question is, if you open the door to all aspects of the doctor's opinion and all of the information provided to him, whether that be done orally in this court or in writing. The people may be at a disadvantage by not getting their hands on the written report if it exists. But the question is, can they still inquire by virtue of the waiver of that privilege that is to be deemed a total waiver into all aspects of the doctor's investigation and formulation of his opinion? Now, granted, you can prevent them from getting a written report by preventing that document from coming into evidence. But the prosecution can certainly inquire of the doctor as follows. How did you form your opinion? Or they may ask, did you form your opinion based on the information that was provided to you? 
they may cross-examine the doctor too. If you are going to examine an expert and then the expert presents his opinion, you have to know that this opinion was relied upon and can be cross-examined by the other side. Counsel, I think the information becomes public knowledge because you are choosing with the consent of your client to put that doctor on the stand. You are waiving the confidentiality factor. You are having him testify as to what was previously totally confidential between you and your client and the doctor. Now, I have not made up my mind yet. I do not know whether or not there is such a thing as a partial waiver. Now, you've provided me with the authorities and cited authorities, and I have studied the issues. With all due respect for the authorities cited, the court will deny the defense motion. I will give an indicated ruling in this case that a written report has been prepared by the doctor. to a few more minutes. For the record. <clears throat> Members of the jury, this is an action in which the plaintiff seeks to recover damages for the death of her brother on the ground that she represents those next of kin who were dependent upon him in his lifetime. Some years ago, the legislature of this state provided for the bringing of this kind of an action. Such a right of action did not exist prior to the passing of that law, but under the law as it was adopted and which now exists, an action may be brought by the next of kin to recover against the defendant through whose negligence the death of the relative was caused. But the law limits the kind of a recovery. In other words, the law permits no recovery for grief or sympathy or emotional reason. The law points with a cold-blooded finger at the liability and says that if this man or corporation is liable, it's liable only to the extent of the money value that the decedent was to his relatives, as the case may be. The evidence in this case shows that he did contribute in his lifetime to his sister, who was a witness on the stand, and that he paid her $75 and sometimes $80 a week and helped her with her rent. She testified that she was a married woman, that her husband was very sick at the time, and that the brother helped her with her rent and other support. The plaintiff brings this action on two theories, one negligence, the other what we call a nuisance. In discussing the first negligence in a death case such as this, all that the plaintiff is obligated to show by a fair preponderance of the evidence is facts which would go to establish the condition that the man's death was brought about solely through the negligence of the defendant. Negligence can be a careless act. Likewise, it may be a careless omission to do something that a person would be bound to do if he acts as an ordinarily careful and prudent person. As to any contributory negligence on the part of the deceased, there is no obligation on the part of the plaintiff to establish that. That duty is on the defendant if he can show it. The other theory on which this action is brought is nuisance, and nuisance is defined this way. Let us take this kind of example. Suppose in this courtroom, on the main floor, there were on the main floor leading to the main entrance a vault covered with a door. Obviously, by reason of the nature of the building and the number of people that walk in and out of this building daily, the public authorities would be charged with diligence to see that the cover of that vault was not only substantial, but safe. And if it got into a poor condition and shook in any way or gave any evidence of insecurity, the city would be charged with knowledge of that if it got direct notice. And if it did not get direct notice, it might be charged with knowledge and notice in the form we call constructive notice, and that is that after a condition such as that exists for a certain length of time, which would be sufficient for the public authorities to discover if their agents were reasonably diligent and observant, and they do not then correct it, then the law would charge those public authorities with negligence in maintaining it or maintaining a nuisance, and for their failure to correct it after a reasonable time had passed, if anything happens to that and the person is injured, they could be charged in law with having maintained that nuisance because that was part of the surface on which people walked 
and which they had a right to anticipate was safe and sound and properly maintained and inspected. In this case, the evidence shows that this man was seen on the eighth floor of the warehouse, that he was putting packages of some kind on a hand truck, which had four wheels on it, and he was about 25 feet from this elevator, which was the eighth floor. Shortly thereafter, the witness, Lee, heard a fall, and on looking down the shaft of the elevator, he saw this man's body at the bottom. Thereafter, he went upstairs and found a truck similar to the one the deceased was using, half on and half off the elevator car, boxes of the cereal strewn on the floor, a chain in the rear, not across the opening, and the car is described as having an 18-inch space between the wall and the rear of the elevator. The evidence shows that the inspector who went there a day or two afterwards or someday inspected the elevator, found it in working order, and described the construction, the same as the other witnesses, being 18 inches from the wall. Whether or not the city of New York inspector filed a violation, it would not relieve the defendant from liability if it maintained a nuisance or if through its negligence in the maintenance of the car this man was injured. Warm? Yay? Me? So, so. Okay, let's do it. I'll just do this one is like two minutes. <clears throat> For the record, let us take this kind of an example. Suppose in this courthouse there were in the floor. Oops, that's the same one. Yep, funny. Let's be used and a couple different speeds. <clears throat> oh, there's no more of that one. All right, let's I'm going to repeat this one I just Okay, here's a different. <clears throat> For the record, <clears throat> Your Honor, the plaintiffs want to make an analogy to a footprint in the sand. The problem, as I see it, is we don't know from any type of test that is presently available what type of footprint it is. What are they exactly trying to present in this courtroom or prove in the courtroom by saying that this white matter on the MRI represents this or that? You can ask yourself by looking at it any of the following questions. Is it an ape, a dinosaur? Is it a coconut that fell from a tall tree? Is it a smudge? Is it some type of ocean wave that splashed incorrectly? If we have sunspots, does that show us something? Don't we have to show the relationship of the sunspots to other things? If we don't, we have no science to back up what we're trying to prove. The plaintiffs are willing to say, see, look, there's a footprint there. There's something there. They say that over and over. They want to just keep making the statement that there's something going on there with this white matter. What does that mean to this case? What value does it have by saying there is something going on? Now, if you can't show that something is normal, that the general community or the doctors would say that is normal, then how can you prove something? What is normal? Nobody knows. I mean to tell you that what is going on here is we're getting science to the point where you're finally going to be able to see every single thing that is going on in the human body. At any time somebody sneezes or something happens, somebody can come in and look and say, hey, I've got proof. There's something wrong here. Something is not normal. Are we supposed to accept that as fact? Well, as we are going through the process of developing the science, we may be able to someday show every single thing that is wrong or not normal. And we'll all be able to say within a every single human being, each human being is different and separate. Don't we already know that? We're all like snowflakes. We're all one of a kind entities. But what exactly does that mean for purposes of the evidence and proving <clears throat> that in a court of law? We clearly saw today the problems in this individual case. 
That is that you are using this information on an individual case without doing some type of comparative analysis of groups or looking at and trying to make out some type of average, trying to use statistics with some degree of reliability. In this case, we are handicapped because we don't even have the original data. We don't even know what the protocols were. We don't even know what the parameters were. We found this information when we were reviewing Dr. Kendall's deposition. By the way, he is still at Sloan Kettering. He and Dr. Beschel abandoned the project before Beschel moved to New Orleans. They abandoned the project. They were treating this as, even, as not even research material. They were not presenting this information to their patients. <clears throat> they were not authoring reports and making reports about it. They were looking at the information, this stuff, and after they were done with it, they got rid of it. They did not even bother to keep it around. The trial argument is where or how did the MRI images ever show up? For the first two years, I only had limited information. Then it was at Dr. Kendall's second deposition that counsel mailed a letter to Dr. Beschel and to the rest of counsel distributing the rest of the images. We finally said something. We said, where did these images come from? Dr. Beschel, as was revealed in her answers to interrogatories, gave them to plaintiff's attorney. And then plaintiff's attorney had asked for these images. The plaintiff's attorney gave them to us. Otherwise, we have no record. We can't even go back and get these images from the custodian of records. They don't even have them. So our own experts for the defense are limited. The experts we have are telling us it doesn't really matter to the case at hand. There's no study saying that this information that's coming off the MRIs has any reliability whatsoever for coming to the conclusion that there has been damage to the white matter of the plaintiff's left frontal lobe. Dr. Sherry told us why he came here today. He is concerned about protecting the technology from being exploited and misread. He does not want the technology, the science, to be intruded upon by lawyers that are coming in and using it to prove their points. Somebody sometime is going to make something out of it when there really isn't the proper research to back it up. Can't you just see a whole parade of new lawyers, personal injury lawyers who have got this tool this reading of MRIs. There is no science or research to support that and generally accept this type of MRI. They want to use this as a footprint to put in front of the jury along with the psychological reports and the symptoms to say that they have something showing on the MRI that really isn't there. Okay, we're going to do cakes. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>